The Lord be with you. Good morning, good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, and this seventh Sunday in the season of Easter. Uh, to those of you who are near, who most often gather in this sacred space for worship, welcome. And to those of you who are gathering with us from wherever you are, in this country or around the world, know that you are welcome. All are welcome. And our worship is enriched and becomes truly a sacred offering to God when we do it together. We have one special feature this morning, and that is our choral anthem. It comes to us from the Worcester Chorus, conducted by Lisa Wong. They performed this piece at the virtual commencement service for the College of Worcester a couple of weeks ago. You can see that service and also the wonderful baccalaureate service by going on the College of Worcester website and finding, following the prompts there. The Worcester Chorus was to begin in the middle of March, uh, their spring tour here in this sanctuary. And the tour itself, the theme of the tour itself, was entitled, I Hope. And I am most grateful to the singers and to Lisa for sharing this with all of us today. And now let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Our service music today comes from two composers who were almost exact contemporaries in the first half of the 19th century, Felix Mendelssohn in Germany and Chopin, Frederick Chopin, who was born in Poland and spent most of his life in Paris. Despite their relatively short lives, they both left a long legacy in the musical world. Chopin revolutionized both piano playing and piano composition, and Mendelssohn left behind a huge body of work, including everything from art songs to symphonies and oratorios. But the other great thing Mendelssohn did for music was to reintroduce J.S. Bach's music to the world after it had lost interest in it shortly after Bach's death, and for that we owe him a an eternal debt of gratitude. Our guest musician today is pianist Carolyn Rice. You have heard her before as a flautist, and believe it or not, that's her second instrument. Among the dozens of fine pianists we are fortunate to have here at First Presbyterian, Carolyn is the only professional among them. She has her own piano studio here with uh, approximately 30 uh, adult and uh, child students and we're very grateful to have her playing Chopin for us today. Thank you.
please join me in the call to worship. This is the time when God's people gather together. This is the time when we wait to hear God's word. This is the time when we think friends, old and new. This is the time when we remember that, despite our distance, God makes us family. This is the time when we give thanks for all that is good. This is the time to worship God. Let us pray. Lord of love, who cares for us all as unique and precious children, teach us, in turn, to love and care for all. During the transitions of life and in these times of uncertainty and anxiety, fill us with your hope, guide us with your love, and hold us in your ever-embracing arms. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of confession. O oh God, what are we that you are mindful of us? How is it that you care about us? Why have you entrusted to us the stewardship of the earth? We confess that we have seen the hungry without giving food, the thirsty without digging wells to fill their cups, the homeless without standing beside them to build shelters from the cold. We count ourselves worthy of your blessing while we consider others undeserving. Forgive our misjudgments, our inaction, our lukewarm faith. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Held in a common love that is within, between, and beyond all, we know forgiveness and are formed into a community of love. May God grant us to live into that love for the sake of others and all creation. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Hi, everybody. Our Bible story today comes out of the book of Acts, and it's a part of the story where Jesus is saying goodbye to his friends. It is time for him to go back to heaven and be with God. And for a lot of his friends, they're confused and they're sad and they, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to carry on without him. Jesus has been such a wonderful teacher and leader to them, and they don't know how they'll do things without him. So it kind of made me think about what we're going through right now. We didn't really get to say goodbye to each other, and some of Jesus' friends didn't get to say goodbye to him either. But we're having to do things new. Jesus told them that they're going to have to find new ways of spreading the love and new ways of teaching about Jesus and all the wonderful things that he does. And so that's what we're doing. We're getting, we're getting together through this, the TV screen or the computer screen. We're sending notes and cards to each other and we're finding new ways to spread God's love. And so just because Jesus left them that day and said goodbye to them does not mean that his love stopped. It does not mean that the people and the followers of Jesus had to stop teaching and had to stop doing all of those things that he told them to do. And so just because we can't be in our church buildings together and because we can't hug and because we can't high five and see each other does not mean that we can't spread Jesus's love like we always have. So I hope you find some creative ways to be the followers of Christ that we are even when we're not meeting together. So maybe send a note to somebody that um, you feel might just need a little hi. Or, you know, when you're out and about taking a walk, wave at somebody. People like to be greeted and they like a smile and they, even behind your mask, they, they like to see a wave or, or just a hello. So just remember that even though we have said goodbye to each other and Jesus' friends said goodbye to him, it didn't stop there. We still need to keep going and we still need to help others um, believe that Christ is still with us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being with us. And even when goodbyes are hard, we know that you're still with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us bow our heads as we pray together to the God who hears and answers. Gracious God, the psalmist said that you were nearer than breathing, closer than hands and feet, and so you are. 
We don't need to shout to be heard. We have only to listen to you, to turn to you, to feel your presence, to know that you are here wherever we are. We know that right now there are others of our number who are joining us in prayer and others who joined us earlier and still others who will be joining later, all praying together to you. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We begin by addressing to you our thanksgiving. Even in times of difficulty, we find more to thank you for than we can name. Around the country in recent weeks, we have seen what it is like when people put their lives on the line on behalf of others. The true heroes of our times, doctors, nurses, aides, floor sweepers, room cleaners, ambulance drivers, garbage collectors, security staff, all caring for sisters and brothers in our society in their extreme need. We see pictures of nurses bending down to caress the foreheads of young patients and of grandparents in their final hours. We hear of, but don't see, first responders risking their lives each time they race to put out a fire, to rescue someone in harm's way, to keep the peace and protect their neighbors. They illustrate what our faith teaches and we learn from them. But heroes come in all shapes and sizes, gracious one. Parents are learning to be teachers. Children are learning to deal with huge changes. Graduates are learning to deal with deep disappointment. Everyone is learning how to value the lives of others by helping to protect them in public places. And along the way, we are discovering new things which, in our hurriedness and sightlessness, we may have missed. We're getting better acquainted with friends. For a phone call or a brief note to someone who might need one. For seeing, perhaps for the first time in a long time, flowers and bushes as they become daily parables of new life for the joy of long walks in different places, for air which is fresher and atmosphere which is cleaner than we have known before in our lifetimes. Thank you, O Caring One, for teaching us new ways of growing up, of reaching out, of digging deeper, of singing the song of the pilgrim on the way of our journey. We pray for the people we don't see and often don't think of. The homeless masses of the Far East who right now are desperate to outrun the tropical storm. For people, some within short distances of our homes, whose livelihoods today are threatened. For planners and thinkers, administrators and leaders who must make decisions that may help but may hurt other people. We remember as we are commissioned to do those who represent us in local, state, and national life. Give them what they need to govern honestly, earnestly, and for the good of all. Stand close to all who protect us in our communities and around the world, especially as we remember in gratitude those who have died in defense of our nation and of all of us. Work within the fertile imaginations of our artists, our writers, our poets, our musicians, our thinkers of new thoughts, that they may open for us fresh doors into the future, still unknown to us, but where you already are. Finally, God of our future, Help us to be the disciples you are looking for. May we be your instruments, instruments of peace where conflict is easier, 
instruments of strength where timidness is more natural. Instruments of generosity where stinginess is more normal. Instruments of grace where selfishness is more common. All of which we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we are one body today, and in whose ministry we are bound to one another, as we say individually, but together, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today is the seventh Sunday of the season of Easter, and it is the last Sunday in the season of Easter. We will be celebrating the end of the Easter season next Sunday uh, as we mark Pentecost. But this past week on Thursday, we marked the Feast of the Ascension in our liturgical church calendar. Uh, This celebration dates from 4th, 5th century, way back in uh, the early centuries of the church. And it is marking a time when we read in the book of Acts that Jesus ascended into heaven. I'm taking the Ascension Day text from the first chapter of the book of Acts, But before I read it, I want to remind us that uh, biblical scholarship considers that the writer of the gospel according to Luke is also the writer of the book of Acts. And to underscore that, I want to read the opening verses of the gospel according to Luke, and then I will enter the first chapter of the book of Acts. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. It seems to me... The time has passed very quickly this spring. Perhaps it is the quarantine metrics that foreshorten these days. I find it hard to believe that we celebrated Easter in our separate homes six weeks ago today. In years past, we would have gathered here in this sacred space our ranks swelling with extra numbers of friends and family in for the special weekend, we would have proclaimed in full voices, Christ is risen, 
Christ is risen indeed. But in the face of the deadly threat of COVID-19, we are distanced in our own houses with the untidiness of our lives, encumbered with threats of other diseases or even death, closely confined in our healthy or unhealthy relationships, left wondering how we would ever proclaim this profound other reality, the reality of God who would be in relationship, in covenant with us, a God who saves and heals and makes all things new. What are we to make of all of this? A response now to the frame, Christ is risen, <clears throat> might sound more like, so what? The church, over two millennia, has become expert at bureaucracy and control, but always struggles with the Christ-like graces the incomprehensible notions of finding one's life by losing it, gaining all by giving it all away, loving oneself and one's enemies. Too often, instead of bearing witness to healing and wholeness and welcome and hospitality for others, particularly all the others, who are different from us, proclaiming salvation through the Christian religion becomes a matter of who gets into heaven and who doesn't. I once read these words on a church sign standing beside a church building, free trip to heaven, details inside. Instead of the ancient Hebrew hope for transformed human life on earth for all peoples, such evangelical religion threatens to become, in the words of Barbara Brown Taylor, individualized, spiritualized, institutionalized, monopolized, focused on the great hereafter, while giving pat answers to the complex and demanding issues of the here and the now. Into such self-absorbed, self-aggrandizing, and richly funded 21st century American religiosity blows the stiff wind of the spirit through this first century telling of the birth of Christ's church. As for the question of who gets into heaven and who doesn't, the immediate answer of the story of the ascension seems to be Jesus does. All the rest of us, even the disciples, will have to wait. But salvation Healing and wholeness for all things does not wait. In his first sermon toward the beginning of the gospel according to Luke, Jesus reads these words from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, turned to the congregation, and said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Heaven may have to wait. But this salvation, good news of release from whatever imprisons people, recovery of vision to those who are blinded, freedom for oppressed communities, this gospel 
is to be proclaimed and acted upon, voted in, and defended today for the glory of God and the healing of God's creation. In Barbara Brown Taylor's words, too often salvation is defined as something that is essentially spiritual and confined to an eternal relationship with God in Christ. But God's saving is a present tense active verb deeply involved in the life and time and pain and pandemic of the world. As inheritors of the good news of Jesus Christ, we are always being, being invited to join in and get on with it. Yet that is not always the message we would like to hear. We are tempted to view the reception of God's grace as a membership card for the, for the blessings in this life and a ticket into the next. After all, the disciples of Jesus had the same idea. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom in Israel? The disciples asked. Or sometimes in our national parlance, is this the time when you will destroy those who hate our nation? Or those whose perspective of our nation is different from ours? The time when you will make it plain to the world that your special blessing rests upon us. 2,000 years have not changed the answer Jesus gives. It is not for you to know what cannot be known, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses locally, across the state and the nation, and to the ends of the earth. And what is the nature of this power, the content of this sacred and holy witness that will come with the blessing of the Holy Spirit? It is the power to do what Jesus commands in the first book of Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Now we can read about how that looked, how that Holy Spirit power was manifested as recorded in Luke's second book, in Acts chapter 2, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Hospitality, generosity, joyful sharing, glad welcome, goodwill. Such would be the witness of the Spirit in those early days of the community gathered around the promise of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. And how far were they to extend that witness? Beyond all borders, beyond all divisions of race or class or politics or economics, beyond the animosity of entrenched hatred and mistrust, beyond self-interest, 
self-indulgence, self-righteousness, self-centeredness? Well, no wonder the disciples stood there, craning their necks as they searched the cloud cover for another glimpse of their Lord. For up to now in the story, Jesus had lived for them. He had shouldered their burdens. He had lived their exemplary lives. He had died their undeserved deaths. But where was he going now? Leaving them to face an uncertain future? Surely, just when they needed strong leadership and clear direction, they were not going to be abandoned. No. Not abandoned, but left behind. Left behind to be the body of Christ in the world. That's what they heard when they stared up into heaven. Why do you stand looking up? They were asked. He's gone, but he said he would return. In the meantime, if you want to see him, look at one another. Look out into the world. The Spirit has been given to us and is blowing freely. The cosmic Christ is among us, even through these certain, uncertain, and anxious days. And it is up to us to be about Christ's work in the world. We are invited to turn from our settled places, to turn even beyond our distantly sheltered places, and continue to bear witness to God's work. It will be the quality of our living, a living that is for each other, and for all others that will determine the authenticity of our witness. This is a daunting task, I know. But we are not alone. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of the risen Christ, the Spirit of the divine, beyond our understanding, goes with us and before us and in us. Amen. I hope to feel comfortable in my own skin.
again. What better words could we hear in this time of threat and uncertainty than, I hope, I hope. As human beings, we have other times in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones and friends, of threat and uncertainty. And if we stop and reflect, we know there is an end. An end that for most of us will be preceded by other endings, other losses. There will be times in our lives when we will feel left behind. And in those times, I pray that we can remember, we can live into, I hope, I hope. May it be so for you and for me. And as you leave the sanctuary this day, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, and that together we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for faithful witness and loving service this and every day. And so may God's joy, God's love, God's peace, God's hope, abide with you now and forevermore.